Hello there, and welcome back to 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series on science epic that aims to retell the story of humanity's march into outer space from the days of Sputnik in 1957 to what's going on today in 2018. From the space race to SpaceX, I'd like to say, I'm your host and guide through the wide open skies and beyond as we embark on this journey together on Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age. Sixty Years of the Space Age, Part 11, Luna and the Moon. This is Part 11 of our story, Sixty Years of the Space Age, where we attempt to retell the story of the human journey to outer space from the launch of Sputnik until the present day. It's raining right now and there's a major thunderstorm outside, but I'm going to persist on recording through it. Where we attempt to retell the story of the human journey to outer space from the launch of Sputnik until the present day. So if you're into that kind of stuff, do stay tuned. Space enthusiasts, science geeks, and new historians alike, this one's for you. I'd like to think there's a little bit of space enthusiast, science geek, and historian in all of us. So really, this one is for everyone. Beyond just being our 11th episode, this is also our first episode of 2018. Even though the 60th anniversary of Sputnik was last year in 2017, this show will carry on as usual. I plan for it to continue until next October 4th of this year, and by that time, we should come full circle. Or as they say in the field of rocketry, we should make a full orbit. We should by then be thoroughly updated with the human journey to outer space in its entirety with all the major milestones and all the major happenings and events of the human space age until the present year of 2018. So until then, prep the rocket boosters, let's plot a trajectory, get ready, and let's go. In our last episode, we talked about the formation of NASA and the beginning of America's space program as the United States began to put a serious effort to counter the emerging threat of Soviet space capability. At that time, at the time NASA was established, Soviet Russia had a clear edge in space capability. This lead in the space race was marked by a series of several firsts. The first object in space, Sputnik. The first living being in space, Laika, the Russian space dog, that unfortunately never made it back safely home to Earth. And soon enough, the Russians would earn another major achievement in outer space. And that's the one that would make the most profound impact on the public opinion of all the peoples of Earth. And that is the first human being in space who was Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. And that major milestone they would achieve only a scant three years after the formation of NASA. America obviously had a lot of catching up to do. Now, all of this was happening while the world was beginning to be gripped in the midst of a fierce competition between East and West. What we know today as the Cold War was this indirect conflict between America and the Soviet Union. The two countries would never meet each other in direct confrontation and open battle, because God forbid if that were to happen, it would have been the end of the world as we know it. But the two superpowers would get involved in various schemes and proxy wars against other countries that were allied with their opponents. Think of the conflicts that happened in Vietnam, Cuba, Afghanistan as examples, and those were some examples of Cold War battlegrounds. The space frontier would become another battleground of this conflict, although not similar to those wars that took place in Vietnam and Afghanistan but it would still be a very important battleground, one that would somehow shape the destiny of humanity's future. The space race gave us a lot of the things that would shape our modern world, believe it or not, some of the things that make life the way that it is today and that you probably couldn't live without had its origins from the Cold War space race contest. And the key word here is contest. 
60 years ago, during that epic contest that would define us, the space race was only just beginning. Both sides were rushing to develop marvelous new technologies that would carry the ambition of their respective nations and ideologies to the stars. So the whole world watched in wonder as to who would lay claim to the stars. Even early on in the space race, with Russia clearly in the lead, it was very clear that the moon, the Earth's largest natural satellite, would eventually become one particular objective to reach for as the race escalated. Whether this objective needed to be reached by humans or robots in order to conclusively determine who the winner of the race was, was not completely clear yet in 1959 at the beginning of the space race. As the journey into the cosmos progressed and the decade changed from the fabulous 50s into the psychedelic 60s, and a glimpse of the human future in outer space was beginning to be realized by the people of Earth, the next few strides of the space race would involve reaching for that most mythic of objects in our solar system, the moon. And these first steps were to be made by the Soviet Union as they maintained their ambitions high, while the Americans were still consolidating their resources and beginning their own human spaceflight program called Project Mercury. Project Mercury would give rise to the first American astronauts like Gus Grissom and Alan Shepard. But before there could be astronaut boots on the moon, there had to be robot missions to pave the way first. Since the Soviet Union had the lead, national pride dictated that they do everything they could to keep it and to reach it. For the motherland, comrade, to the stars! Soviet leadership, spearheaded by Premier Nikita Khrushchev, knew that if America was allowed to put the full weight of its industrial and intellectual capacity behind its own space program, then the Russian lead and dominance in space would be compromised. So really, the space race was anybody's game. So the plan after the second Sputnik going from the 1950s into the 1960s, was around the time where my parents were born, was to dissuade the American effort by winning more and more short-term gains, more and more first accomplishments in space. And that was the political objective and motivation behind it. The scientific objective and motivation, driven by chief designer Sergei Korolev, was to get a man into space and was to get a further human presence in space and perhaps, just perhaps, get a man on the moon before the Americans beat them to it. So obviously the two parties, the Soviet political system and the guy who was designing the rockets for the Soviets were operating at vastly different wavelengths. There goes that Russian accent again. They were operating with different motives and intentions. Sergei Korolev, the chief designer, wanted to push forward the space frontier for the sake of pushing the space frontier. Deep down, his goals were for humanity. So there was somewhat of, but still, there was somewhat of an intersection of interests here. And this intersection of interests played off of each other to yield some really awesome results early on. So long as Korolev delivered these amazing results, these first achievements with his rockets, he was allowed to lead the Russian space program. Sergei Korolev was known to overwork himself while trying to chase his ambitions. He was a very shrewd person who knew how to maneuver the political fields as well as design rockets. So in a sense, he's the whole package. But because he was really into it, he was known for pushing himself beyond his limits. And that would later take a toll on his life in the 1960s. And he wasn't the only scientist known to be uh, to overwork himself for the sake of achieving his own goals. Actually, Nikola Tesla was also known to be quite the savage in this regard. But, yeah, there was always a fine line to be walked by the legendary chief designer in between where the ambitions of the Soviet party and 
his own ambitions of pushing the space frontier. The next move to be undertaken by the Russians was called the Luna program, often called Lunik by the West, as the name implies. Luna would reach for the moon. The program involved a series of robotic spacecraft that would travel to the moon and conduct experiments like scanning for radiation and taking pictures. Through Luna, we received our first glimpses of the far side of the moon. That's the side of the moon that's always facing away from Earth. It's sometimes referred to as the dark side of the moon. Like that third Transformers movie, but just like the relationship between Michael Bay's explosion, explosions and movie quality, this is misleading because when the moon is between the Earth and the Sun, like during a new moon, it's the far side that's illuminated by sunlight, and it's the near side that's in the dark. Robotic missions to photograph the unknown regions of the cosmos, just like Luna, would become a staple of humanity's endeavor to explore and discover the universe for the decades to come. I know personally that one of the reasons that I became interested in the cosmos was because of the amazing pictures that spacecraft like Voyager and the Hubble Space telescope returned to Earth, they definitely instilled in me a sense of awe and wonder in the universe and the possibilities of just what might be out there. The Luna program began in 1959 and would carry on for nearly two decades until the 1970s. There were many rockets launched under the Luna program and given Luna designations like Luna 1, Luna 2, Luna 3, and so on. Some of the rockets launched would fail in one way or another, while others would make it to the moon as either orbiters or landers. Only flights that successfully completed their mission to the moon were formally given Luna numberings. And just like Sputnik, the first few launch attempts failed to orbit. You gotta remember that spaceflight was still very much in its infancy at this time. The margin of error for rocket launches was far bigger than it is today. These were the pioneering days of spacecraft getting into space. And the first Luna craft flew in 1959. It was more modest in size compared to the ship that Laika flew in at 300 kilograms. Luna 1 carried scientific instruments such as magnetometers, Geiger counters, and micrometeorite detectors. The launch happened on the 2nd of January 1959 and was meant to impact the moon, but due to a programming error, Luna 1 missed the moon by several thousand kilometers. So close by space standards. That gives you an imagining of just how big the scale of space is. Luna 1 missed the moon, but became the first artificial satellite to orbit the sun. Kind of like an artificial planet, really, wandering about, orbiting the sun. The next Luna spacecraft would fly later that year in September during the next launch window. Luna 2 would succeed where Luna 1 failed, becoming the first human-made object to impact the moon. During this, doing this was actually quite an achievement in the space race. A common conception, or you could say misconception, was that America had better guidance systems, computational guidance systems, compared to the so Soviet Union. The USSR may have had big and scary, more powerful rockets, but they tended to fly like potatoes. Computer technology, or what counted for computers back then, was far in favor of the West. But Luna 2, in 1959, challenged that. Luna 2 fell on the moon on September 13, 1959, crashing near a place called the Mare Imbrium, known as the Sea of Showers, the third largest crater on the moon. The spacecraft carried with it to the Sea of Showers two Soviet pennants that had engraved on them the words USSR 1959. During Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev's only visit to, to the United States, when he met with President Eisenhower, he gave the president a replica of the very same pendants that Luna 2 sent to the moon. Wow. Talk about sending a message, huh? Oh, snap! We just buried you, son! Oh yeah, by the way, our political system is way better than yours. Nani nani boo boo, too bad for you who. That's totally what Nikita Khrushchev said to President Eisenhower, by the way. You can quote me on that. 
The pieces of those plates that Luna 2 impacted on the moon are still there on the moon. And maybe one day when we've decided to go back there again, we could go find them and put them in a museum for all mankind to appreciate. But Luna 2 wasn't the end. Later on in October, just a month later in October, the third Luna spacecraft flew to the far side of the moon and returned the first ever pictures of that side which would have never been visible from Earth. Luna 3 sent back never before seen pictures of the side of the moon that faced away from Earth. Since the moon completes one rotation, at the same time it completes one orbit, this is called synchronous rotation, we always see the same side of the moon facing us. The Soviet Luna 3 gave us the first ever images of that mysterious and previously unknown side of that goddess in the sky, the far side. You can Google these images and their quality is quite poor by today's standards because the way they managed to take these pictures was through a very cumbersome electromechanical device on board the spacecraft. Today's spacecraft use far better digital imaging. But the pictures, nonetheless, generated a lot of interest all over the world in 1959. And they were a testament to the power of exploration towards inspiring and enlightening the human spirit. It was pretty lit, honestly. And we can do much more with today's technology, actually. If only we stopped spending so much on weapons that could kill one another. Sheesh! Dang it, I'm trying to go to space. Won't you people stop fighting all these needless wars? Sheesh! God dang it. Yeah. Ah. Uh. It's important to note that in order to get to the moon, you don't just fly out there in space and like go to where the big round object in the sky is. You have to plan it in advance and what you do is you have to aim for where the moon will be when you get there in three days. Now doing this involves a maneuver called a translunar injection or TLI. It's actually quite fun. What you do is you have to get slingshotted around the orbit of the Earth before embarking on a stretched out what they call eccentric orbit for a quarter of a million mile trip through space and three days later you get caught by the moon on the other side of that maneuver orbit orbit maneuver. Luna 1 was the first object to attempt this maneuver while Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin would be the first humans to pull it off. Yeehaw! Hopefully more humans in the future will also embark on that winding journey. The Luna program would contribute much more to the human progress of exploring the moon later on until the 1970s as Americans were walking on that hallowed surface the Soviet Union would continue to send robotic emissaries to Earth's only natural satellite. Each mission further enhancing human understanding of the cosmos that we are all a part of. Luna and the Moon was the first ever physical contact between the Earth and another celestial body. Like the first time you dip your toe into water before diving even further into a vast cosmic ocean. It was the first time human beings had ever cast their aspirations, Morty, aspirations onto another world in a way unlike any other before. The first time we reached out and with the help of our machines touched down in another world world. Of course, sooner or later, the Soviet Luna program would be eclipsed by the first man in space, and even more so by the Apollo missions. But something has to be said for that first touch, like the gentle caress or a letter by a now not so distant lover. Luna and the moon will, in my opinion, be remembered forever. Ski up! You're done now. Big Terra, out. Ski up! up. If you enjoy this type of work and wish to support it as a creative endeavor for all mankind to appreciate, be sure to drop us a donation at our Patreon, link down below. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and the usual social media. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Boop!